uh, I'll start because. Oh, there you go. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome to GLREA's uh, Anniverse Solar Stories. I am Julie Roth. I host the Anniverse Solar Stories um, on the, I think it's the first Thursday of every month. That's where you are right now. Um, also, if you haven't, if you don't already know this and you haven't been here on the second Thursday of every month, the GLREA does a clean energy seminar hosted by Mark Cleavy. That's uh, just all kinds of different topics around clean energy. On the third Thursday, our Detroit Solar Stories, where we hear about um, solar stories from our biggest city. And on the fourth, fourth Thursday is my or Michigan Solar Stories or an energy Q&A. So it varies. So if you're if you're here for the first time and you're not aware of all of this, you can sign up um, on the GLREA website for Thursday night energy events. And then you get uh, weekly reminders of what's happening that Thursday and, um, and you can tune in to the ones that interest you. Um, I should also note that the Ann Arbor Solar Stories um, is sponsored by several entities, including EGLE, the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, um, Homeland Solar, McNaught McKay Electric Company, Iron Ridge Racking, and Harvest Solar. So we thank all of the sponsors that help make this uh, doable. We should also note that the GLREA is a 501c3 nonprofit formed in 1991. Um, and it's created to um, educate and advocate for renewable energy in, in the Great Lakes area. And if anyone here doesn't know, the advocacy part just paid off quite mightily with the most recent DTE rate case. I think we can, there are a lot of organizations who weighed in, including the city of Ann Arbor, where I'm from, but the GLREA did a, a huge amount of work um, advocating uh, against what was being proposed in that rate case and basically just won almost the vast majority of their arguments. So we we owe them a, a great big thank you <laughs> to the GLREA for that advocacy. Um, and to that end, uh, the way you can help GLREA is becoming a member. Uh, you can renew your membership or become a member on their website. You can financially sponsor um, a membership for a local teacher or student who you think might be interested in clean energy um, and encourage others, or you can just make a financial donation as well to support their work. So that's all the business of things. And if I didn't introduce, did I introduce myself? I'm Julie Roth. I'm a, the Senior Energy Analyst at the Office of Sustainability and Innovations. And today we have a fabulous guest that I am so excited about, which is Fong Wu who was the previous community energy manager with OSI, our office, and who we lost to industry, dang it. And, um, but she is uh, phenomenal. She's an economist by education. So all of you who are really interested in the, like what exactly is before and after every decimal point, She's your girl, um, and she is going to present her solar story today with a particular attention on on rates and things as well, and all those decimal points. So, I'm just going to hand it over to Fong. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Julie. Yeah, and uh, I'm so happy to be here, and so many familiar faces again, and so nice to see you all. And uh, for my presentation, you know. Um, I, I, I will, because now I see today we have many experts here. So I probably will go faster than I planned, you know, but for some people, if you some definition and some terms you, you don't know, or you want to know what it, what it does it, it is exactly mean, you know, please, you know, I will reserve question time later so you can feel free to ask. And uh, plus we have tons of experts here. So I'm just sharing what I learned as a residential uh, DG customer. Fong, I don't know about anybody else, but your audio is a little bit soft. Um, oh. Is anyone else having that? Am I getting slightly better? That's much, much better. Yes. Okay. So. Thanks. Okay. Okay, so first, 
so I'm so happy to be given the opportunity to share with you my experience with rooftop solar system. And this is my solar system. It is, um, oh, sorry. Let's see, how can I? Okay. Yeah, so this is my rooftop solar system. You know, it is 7.22 kilowatt capacity and uh, includes 19 panels. Because my roof is not big enough, so 11 panels on the south roof and the seven panels on the west side. It is installed in March through the Ann Arbor Solar Rise Group by program. It is a great program for residents who are considering rooftop solar system. I will talk about my experiences as a DTV residential solar customer, you know, how to understand your energy consumption pattern and choose the best pricing option based on your consumption habits. For those audience who have installed solar, I wanted to share how to estimate the daily kilowatt hour of solar used on site and the solar outflow using the data provided by DTE and the solar inverter app. Lastly, I will chat about DTE rate case and its impact, bill impact on DT customers. Let's talk about your usage pattern. We may have a rough idea of how we use energy every day. However, do you know what your minimum electricity hourly usage is? What's your maximum hourly demand? What percentage of electricity is used during peak hours? Having a clear picture of your energy usage pattern will help you choose a rate option that could reduce 10 to 20% of your monthly electricity bill. It will also help you to identify the energy consumption of those always own appliances. You can download the past 12, 13 months hourly usage data if you log into your DT online account. So you can estimate what percentage of usage is during peak hours. What is always on kilowatt usage? Should you, should you get rid of the old freezer, which consumes lots of electricity? And for DG customers, DTE does not provide hourly solar outflow data. I will give you an opportunity to estimate it if you want this information. And uh, so DTE delivers, uh, okay, so I think the, I will talk about the pricing option first. The screenshot shows some pricing options offered by DTE. Now the first three options are the most common options. You don't need a second meter for those options. Among them, the first one is the default pricing, which charges a fixed rate per kilowatt hour no matter when you use electricity. The time of day and the dynamic peak pricing charge a higher rate during peak hour and a cheaper rate during off-peak hours. For solar customers, the credit for outflow energy varies depending on the pricing plan chosen. If you stay with the first option, DTE pays a fixed outflow credit around eight cents per kilowatt hour. If you choose the time of day rate, the credit for outflow energy will be 15 cents during peak hours and 4 cents during off-peak hours. The rest rate options require a separate meter. For example, the geothermal rate means DTE charges the electricity to run the geothermal system at a discount. To be eligible for that rate, you must install a separate meter to measure the energy used by the geothermal system. And this chart shows my 24 hour load curve during weekdays and weekends before I have solar. Most of my energy consumption occurs during off peak hours. The always on appliances use about 0.5 kilowatt per hour. Before solar installation, 20% of electricity usage occurred during peak hours. If I choose the time of day rate, the electricity bill will be 20% less than staying with the standard rate 
plan, which is fixed pricing. This chart shows the energy usage after solar installation. The, uh, the yellow bar shows the monthly outflow of solar energy. The gray bar represents the solar energy used on site. Add them together will be the total solar generation for that month. So you can see June is the, is the month generated lots of solar energy than other months. And there's a blue bar is the volume of the electricity I purchased from the grid. On average, 48% of solar energy generated is used on site. As for the total energy consumption, 35% of power is from rooftop solar. It directly replaces the solar from the grid. I purchased the rest 65% power from DTE. Therefore, I signed up for the My Green Power subscription to offset using the energy generated from fossil fuels. This chart shows the monthly bill saving generated by the solar system. I chose the time of use rate because it matches my energy consumption pattern. The average inflow power on peak hour is only 9% versus 20% before I have the solar system. I also sell more solar energy during peak hours than off peak hours. Therefore, the monthly bill credit from outflow is 54 on average. The blue bar shows the outflow credit under the time of day rate option. If I stay with the standard rate option, the outflow credit will be 10 to 30% less than the time of time of rate, uh, a time of use the rate option. The average bill saving from using solar energy on site is 80 per month. So the total monthly bill saving is about 135 per on average. If I follow this trend, the solar system will be paid back within eight years. Now let's talk about the solar usage data breakdown because DTE does not provide hourly or daily kilowatt hour of solar energy outflow. So um, I found a way to estimate it because they give an aggregated outflow kilowatt hour on, uh, oh, I should say, uh, because you can get the total electricity inflow data and the net usage from the, uh, from their energy dashboard. Then you can estimate the difference between them is the outflow kilowatt hour of that day. For example, the November 10th, the D, based on DT Inside app, the net usage of inflow is 28.2 kilowatt hour. And uh, the total inflow electricity for that day is 74.6 kilowatt hour. Then the solar outflow is 19.4 kilowatt, kilowatt hour for that day. Once we get the solar outflow estimation, we can estimate the solar used on site. Then you have to look at, the, you must look at the inverter app. For, for my case, I use the solar edge as my inverter. So I can look at the total daily generation of solar energy. For that day, the solar system generated 24 kilowatt hour solar. Then with the solar outflow data, so I can, the, the solar used on site is 4.6 kilowatt hour. And it is a weekday, so I use less energy. Now, then how to shorten the solar system payback period. First, based on my experience, you should understand your energy usage pattern and choose a rate plan that works best for you. Secondly, use more solar energy on site. Plan your energy usage based on the weather forecast when you can. For example, if I know the weekend will be sunny, I will plan to charge my EV and do laundry at weekends. Thirdly, switch out natural gas appliances when they should be replaced. Electrify your home step by step. You know, 
and uh, we all know DTE just, uh, MPSC just approved the most recent DTE rate case. And the DTE proposed a new DTE rate for residential solar customers. It will charge a demand charge and which makes the solar system has no payback period at all. Great Lakes Renewable Energy Association and other organizations have done tremendous work to show the public and uh, the authority the detrimental impact of the proposed DG rate. So finally, DTE pulled back that, pro that DG rate. And DT other than that, DTE also proposed another standard time of use rate as a default residential rate. I will talk about that later. And, uh, and the MPSC ordered uh, over 30 items DT should follow. And the two items are related to our DG customers. The first one is within 90 days from the order, which was released um, in November 18. Now, DT should provide a proposal to for the to purchase the renewable energy credit from DG customers for their voluntary green pricing program. And uh, secondly, DT should provide a, rate, a new DG rate plan for uh, DG customers, especially new DG customers when they reach the 1% cap. So there are more to come. Then this table shows the approved rate related to DG customers. For currently, solar customers can choose either D1 or D1.2 rates, which are circled in red and blue. And uh, for this rate, ca rate case, MTC, MPSC also approved another two rate options for solar customers. They are D1.8 dynamic peak pricing and the D1.11 standard time of use rate. D DTE proposes the standard time of use rate will be residential default rate no later than May 2023, if my memory is correct. Um, but the, this time of use rate is different from the current D1.2 time of day rate plan because DTE changes the peak hours from 11 to from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. to 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. in this in the in the proposed default residential rate. So um, it may not be friendly to solar customers, you know, because I haven't done a day a deep data analysis regarding the impact to DT customer. Um, but I, I did some estimation, you know, for the recently approved um, D1 and D1.2 rate. So in general, the approved rate option may not cause a significant bill increase because MPSC only approved less than 10% of the requested cost, cost increase. The, the power supply chain is decreased than previous rate case. And the distribution charge is only up to 4% versus the original proposal is over 20% increase. And the good news for DG customers, the solar outflow credit is also slightly higher. It's about two to 3% higher. So then what's the actual bill impact on your energy? on your energy bill. Um, it actually depends on your energy usage pattern. You know, there is not, not a one answer fit for all. For example, I used the one DG customers past the 12 months hourly usage data to estimate the bill impact of the approved D1 rate. For this customer, the monthly bill will be 9% less if she stays with the D1 rate option. And uh, if the customer stays with the D1.2 time of day rate, the monthly bill will be 5% higher you know, uh, than previous uh, uh, D1.2 rate plan. 
However, the total net bill for 12 months for this customer is still $70 less than on the D1 rate. So for this specific DG customer, the D1.2 time of day use still is better than D1 rate. Okay, so this is the end of my presentation and this is my email. And now I will pass the floor to Julie again. Thank you for being here. Oh, Fang, thank you. This, uh, I can't imagine an audience that more receptive to those sorts of details than this particular one. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing that people just eat that up. That's fantastic. Beautiful charts. Um, I agree with someone in the chat who said that the the one that shows that um, the energy used on site versus outflow and what you're buying from the grid was really um, it was nice to see visually. I'm a visual person. I liked that. So I'll I'll um, open it up. Just open it up to questions, comments from the group. Just raise your hands. Jump in. Well, this is John Freeman. I just want to give a shout out to John Richter for doing great work on the DTE case that Fang really highlighted. And uh, so I just want to give him the credit where it's due. Thank you. Agreed. Fang, I, guess. Oh, Fang, I was wondering if you could tell us more. You, you do have a geothermal heat pump or an air source heat pump. Could you tell us more about that? Oh, I, I have an air source heat pump and so I installed it before I have solar system and I planned that way because I wanted to you know, increase the maximum capacity I could install. And, uh, and but finally I didn't uh, install the capacity that was allowed for me, you know, because, because I also concerned about the payback period. So I per, you know, intentionally you know, scaled down the solar capacity a little bit in order to you know, in shorten the payback period because the more solar you used on site shortens your payback period. And as for heat pumps, when I noticed um, for my case, uh, actually um, the, the heat pump runs most of the time is there is no, so, no sun out because um, when the outdoor temperature is low, like the early morning and evening, there is no solar. And when the sun is out, because my home has, has lots of south facing window, so the indoor temperature is already high enough, so it does not need heat. So for my case, I I don't think um, uh, my heat pump uses lots of solar energy. I wonder, have you done it through a summer? This is a winter. Yeah, um, so I, I start from March to November. So like the November and October, we have cold days. So I yeah. watched, you know, when heat pump runs, do, do I have solar? Sometimes I, the heat pump do use solar energy to, for running, but most of the time it runs like before, before 9 a.m. or after like 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> yeah, so, that, so that's my case because my home has, you know, lots of windows facing south. Yeah, so I uh, think this is depending, you know, depend on case by case. You know, if you don't have lots of south, southern facing window, then you need a heat pump to generate the heat during the daytime. So then, then it can use lots of solar energy for that case. Yeah, and also depends on where you install the outdoor unit of the heat pump. Because if you install the, the heat pump outdoor unit on a southern spot has lots of sunshine. So I, I think it will also reduce your energy demand for heating you know, in winter when the sun is out. I, I see. hadn't thought about that. That's interesting. Yeah, Dave, <laughs> yeah, I Dave. think that's my, my observation. You know? <laughs> yeah. And I see Dave Curtis, the hands is on. Yeah, I'm interested to know how DTE reacted to the 
decisions that came down, whether they were, okay, yeah, we really need, should think about that, or <laughs> what the hell are you saying? You know what I mean? Yeah, that, that I probably will pass the question to John Freeman or, yeah. <laughs> no, I think John I Richter that's... should respond. Go ahead, John. Yeah, so um, I haven't seen any reaction from DTE to the actual order, but in the step of the case just before that, they were bringing up legal and constitutional issues, arguing that the commission did not have the legal authority to do certain things, which in their order they in fact did. Um, so I think there's a good chance the DTE will ask for a rehearing, um, which I don't think will be successful. And then there's um, you know, a significant chance they, they could appeal this to a court and, and make those arguments they, they made in the case that um, the commission has exceeded their legal authority. I think that's a bogus argument. I don't think they'll succeed there either, but I wouldn't be surprised if they tried. Thank you. And then just to add one more thing, and then they'll probably just wait two months and then follow another rate increase, unfortunately, because that seems to be their standard operating practice almost, so. Exhausting. Fong, I had a question. You mentioned that there is another time of use rate that they're mm -hmm. issuing, and um, the slide was up not long enough for me to digest it, but, um, and I think you said that the on-peak hours were shortened in that yes. or, or shifted or something? Can you? Shortened. So now the, for, no, for the, 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 the time of day, D1.2, the peak hours is, is from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. So then as a solar, you know, rooftop solar, I think the peak generation hours is from like, from nine or 10, from 10 to, to three or four, right? Yeah, so there is a, if you go with the time of use rate, you know, so the peak hour matches your solar generation peak hours. So which brings you more outflow credit. But now they shot, they shrink it to from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. That period actually is not solar's peak generation hours. So you generate less solar outflow than if you are on time of use rate, you get a less outflow credit. And they're gonna um, default everyone into that rate? That I, I don't know specifically how they would implement it. Based on my memory in the rate can be proposed is like for, they will automatically transfer or like residential customer, if you are in current default rate to the uh, default residential time of use rate, you know, by certain date, and you have a certain period to tell them, I wanted to opt out and I wanted to stay with other rates. You know, um, th but uh, I think for, for the, uh, or from the order, I don't see, you know, the, process how they wanted to implement that rate. And I did a rough bill impact analysis using the specific, the same DG customers rate. I think because for that proposed default time of use rate, there is not much um, uh, pricing difference between the peak hour and off peak hours. So it the, the the bill will be very similar to customer who are in the current uh, default standard rate, which is fixed rate. So, Dale, yes, I see our hand. So I, I wanted to add to that. Thank you, Fong, for uh, doing all this comparison between the rates. And I think that's typically not what people do because it's all complicated. Um, I agree, I did a bunch of spreadsheets and calculations to to decide. And in the end, I, I chose to be on D1.2. And I think that is best for solar people just because it, the time period 11 to seven uh, lines up with more of your 
uh, your outflow at least five days of the week. Weekends are still off peak. Um, and the other thing I would um, mention is they'll probably send a note or an email or something to most everybody who's not already on D1.2 or some other rate. Anybody on D1, the normal flat rate, they're gonna send some notification. And I think they might've done that already because I called DTE yesterday about something else. And in, in the, uh, the menus on the phone, one of them was, did you receive this message about changing to the time of use rate? Um, and so they may, that may be in process already. Um, the last point I would make is, um, I think it's Rob Rafson who has uh, recommended doing this. And I, I, I would recommend doing it. I didn't do it myself, but for the, the typical customer who has solar or doesn't even have solar or whatever, it's supposed to be the utility company's responsibility to tell the customer what your cost would be on the different rates. So you could call DTE or consumers and say, hey, I'm on this rate currently. I'm considering choosing one of these other ones, especially if you get this note that says switch to, to D1.11. Um, DTE should be able to tell you based on your previous usage over the past year, you ask them, what would my bill be if I was on D1 or 1.2 or D111 or even the D1.8? And they're supposed to do that. They'll probably have to, they must have a spreadsheet to do that. And um, I would recommend anybody who's curious um, and maybe is not quite as, as uh, enthusiastic with spreadsheets, just call DTE and ask them and they should do that. And if they say that they, if they say they won't or they say they don't have to, please uh, mention that to somebody here. Uh, let me know, or you can complain to the Public Service Commission um, and the Public Service Commission will probably tell them, no, you, you need to do this for anybody who asks. Dale, I'm gonna jump in just cause um, this is directly related. So when I, quite some time ago, not, a year ago or so, um, I was sorting this out for myself and talking to Fong and I was on the regular D whatever rate. And uh, she was saying, you should switch. <laughs> and I did, but I did call DTE. And the first time I said, I'd like to know, you know, what's the better rate and um, and switch to it if it is. And I was on the phone with this woman who was giving me misinformation. She was telling me, no, no, you don't want to switch because all of your credits that you've built up will be tossed out and just all of these just and she wasn't doing any calculations for me. She wasn't giving me the answers. So Fong gave me the answers. I switched. They did not throw away my credits. Right. In fact, I had no bill, for electricity bill for months because they just loaded all my credits. I don't, yeah. I don't know what they did. But anyway, it was, they were not helpful. <laughs> I, I would confirm, I confirm that too. Like I, uh, even if, the other thing you can do, even if you're still on net metering, if you're still net metered, you're going to, you have 10 years from when you installed. If you installed a couple of years ago, you're still on net metering. Any credits or um, account balance that you have, whether it's kilowatt hours or dollars, if you change rates, they move that over to the new rate or they reimburse you. And one thing you can definitely do, I was net metered still for a while and I changed to the D1.2 rate on when I was still net metered and DTE will tell you, no, 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 don't do that. And they have a point, it's confusing to most people, the buckets, the four different, you know, summer, winter, on peak and off peak are different buckets and you get four different banks of kilowatt hours. And you might be making all of the kilowatt hours during the on peak, usually that builds up and you never use it up from the summer. Um, so you have this big summer bank and you never use it up. You use it up when you switch to whatever other rate or when you get kicked off of net metering onto the DG tariff where it's not banked in kilowatt hours anymore. So yes, you can do that. And it's a, it's a good thing you can do because um, it depends on your system. But if you have, if, if you're building up a credit usually during part of the year, um, switching to the time of use rate, even on even when you're still net metered is good. 
you'll get that value back in the future. And the net metered credit is in kilowatt hours. So it'll be turned into dollars when you convert later. And as far as I know, the electric companies are never gonna, in, never gonna decrease the value of kilowatt hours. They're always gonna try to charge more for it. So. Yeah, thank you. It's good to know. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Jonathan? Oh, thanks. Uh, hi, Fung. Well, actually, Dale touched on the point that I was going to ask about relative to um, credits being created in one bucket, you know, let's say winter off peak and, and then or actually created in in one bucket like summer on peak and then not being able to be used in another uh, time frame. Um, I had uh, understood the same thing that if we changed rate plans that we would that at some point DTE would then credit us that back in in the form of uh, money. So um, interesting discussion because I've I've got the geothermal rate plan and I've got certain credits that I cannot use because I cannot use enough air conditioning in the summer um, to make up for the amount of solar that I'm generating in that in that time frame. So yeah, uh, once you um... Once you're convert, so you're still on net meter then maybe? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so once, uh, if you can handle however many years it will be until you get to, um, in when you get moved into DG, that, that credit in kilowatt hours can continue to bank up and then you'll get however many hundreds of dollars as a credit on your account in the future. It, you know, it may not make sense to like invest your money with DT like that, but yeah. right. th you can do that. Um, yeah, but once you're once it's once you're on one of the DG rates, uh, and you're no longer net metered, then the banking is in dollars and, and cents. And so then whatever you whatever outflow credit you make during any time period, so on peak, it's it, if you're on time of use, it's like fifteen or sixteen cents. You get credit for outflow, and then you can use that credit in dollars just for power supply for any other time period. So for example, what I'm doing now, I'm, I'm converting our house over more to electric and get rid of the natural gas. And generally my outflow is during the summertime on peak, at least five days a week. So I have this nice ba credit balance that's built up over the summer. And now I'm starting to use that. And my system is set up so that it's a hydronic system. So I have a limited amount of, of heat storage in a buffer tank. So I can easily, and like Fong said, the sun shines during the day, usually it's warmer and you don't need that much heat during the day. So if you have any kind of thermal storage or battery storage, um, you can avoid using any on-peak uh, electricity most of the time. So for heating, I can do all my heating with off-peak electricity at like four or five cents. So every outflow kilowatt hour that I make on-peak in the summertime or even in the wintertime uh, on-peak gets me like three kilowatt hours that I can bring in off peak and you just have to pay delivery. So it's kind of like a coupon for six or seven cent electricity um, off peak. Interesting. I, I, I've got to go run the calculations on the distributed generation because it seemed like when I lose net metering that I will lose um, some degree of efficiency in terms of gaining those credits. So. You, yeah, you'll lose some. I mean, you won't lose anything that you've banked, but the deal, the, the, it doesn't work as good. It's it's uh, not as economical to be DG because your outflow credit is not the same as your inflow cost anymore. Yeah. So. Okay. But the idea with the 10-year grandfathering clause is that hopefully after the 10 years is up, you would have paid most of your system off through the original net metering program. Most likely, certainly, yeah. Yeah, and I think John Reed just put a note in the chat saying that customers will have 90 days of period to choose opt, uh, opt out of the proposed, you know, the, the D111 default standard time of use rate option. Yeah, so, <laughs> so for some of you, if you are still in the, in the standard residential rate, consider, think about it, you know, which, and the final, is to choose a, a rate that works best for you before they you know silently switch into that default TOU rate. 
Fang, I think I think Bob Sink had a question. Bob, go ahead. Well, I thought he did. Robert, if you are talking, you are on mute. Nope. <laughs> Other questions or discussion? Yeah, and I just realized I forgot to mention another point about payback period. <laughs> uh, uh, because now when we calculate the solar payback period, we always we just uh, calculate the electricity bill saving, then use that number to estimate number of years the system will how many years the system will pay back by itself by the solar generation. However, there's another big chunk of benefit we we don't mention a lot. That is the um, the the property value increase. Like based on the Zillow, you know, the, the website, they, they, uh, they did uh, a <clears throat> the estimation, they found out for the same condition home, two homes, same condition, the home with solar, the, the market value will be on average 4% higher than the home has no solar system. So if you use like the median uh, home value, you know, in, for the for the year that they did the study, I think they did a study around in the 2019. The average premium for the solar system when you uh, sell the home is about eight to nine thousand. So then plus the inflation we have this those years, so it will actually be more. So if you count in that value to the payback period. I think solar system is actually a very good financial investment if you just don't talk about, you know, carbon emission reduction. <laughs> yeah, and the Robert, you're back, Bob, should I say? Hi there, yeah, I had to step away for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to say, uh, well, I live in Grand Rapids, so I have consumer's energy in, in, instead of DTE. So my um, credits are just in dollars. Um, so it's uh, it's simpler. Um, and then I wanted to ask you about the um, air source heat pump. I'm very interested in getting that myself. And I was wondering if is that uh, sufficient or do you have to have uh, like a, a gas uh, furnace backup? Well, I think it depends on the situation and on and of your home design and your current electrical panel capacity. So, so there's multiple factors you need to consider before you, you know, electrify your HVAC system. For my case, uh, the air source heat pump system I installed is, is a hybrid. I have a, a gas furnace as a backup heating system and the air source heat pump. The reason I chose that is because if I want to go all electric system, um, I need to install an air handler and uh, I install a better version of air source heat pump. And, uh, and also I have to redo my electrical wiring system because my current utility room don't have the, you know, enough, the power outlet required for, for both to power air handler and the heat pump. So that, then the total cost is much higher than I could afford. So that's why I stay with the you know, combo, you know, natural gas furnace plus the heat pump. And, uh, and for me, I think it's uh, so far, it, it's, not bad, it's a not bad decision because um, first, uh, because I switched to time of day usage, pro, you know, the rate plan. And uh, based on my observation, heat pumps most of the time they run during off peak times to generate heat, I mean, for heating. Mm -hmm. In summer, it's the same as an air conditioning for my case. And uh, for like uh, 
cloudy days, they yeah they do use more electricity during peak hours, but that's not the major portion of electricity for heat pump heating. Mm -hmm. And if it's run during off peak hours, the electricity price is much less than you know on peak peak uh, peak uh, okay. uh, cost yeah. and. And it's kind of like a break even if you use heat pump for heating versus use natural gas for heating. Mm -hmm. you know? But that's for a time of use rate. If you are on a standard rate, if you use heat pump for heating, you probably will pay more heating bill mm -hmm. you know, than using natural gas furnace for heating. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I see wing, wings hand up. Wings hands is up. So it's your I, I was hoping yeah. Wings hand would be up because I was going to call on him anyway. Well, um, I can tell you that I have had an air source heat pump for the last two years, and it totally heats and cools my house without any resistance backup. So uh, they do work well in this climate. I have about an 1800 square foot house, and it's a four ton unit. And uh, I have a fair amount of south facing glass, so it varies. But, but of course, you know, your maximum usage is it, your maximum heat loss is going to be on a cold winter night and it, it's done just fine. So um, a good quality unit that's cold climate uh, focused and, and it'll do down to well below zero works fine in this climate. Thank you. Wayne. You know, I was, uh, I was thinking in terms of, uh, you know, if, if if equipment breaks, you know, going for the heat pumps, and I have a, a natural gas water heater and a natural gas furnace and a, a real efficient air conditioner, electric, of course. And uh, I was thinking, okay, probably the water heater is going to die first, but it could be five years from now, and you know, replace it with a heat pump. Just kind of anticipating, uh, you know, because the problem, right, with all these decisions is that it happens uh, in, in February. <laughs> when you want hot water or heat or something, you know, and, uh, but it, it dawned on me, and I think the point was already made that uh, uh, for me, actually, uh, if the air conditioner goes, and my air conditioner uh, might be coming to the end of its useful life, I should probably get a, uh, an air source heat pump at that point, because I can, if the natural gas furnace is still working, uh, like Fang mentioned, I can use it as backup. So that's kind of my plan now to kind of uh, uh, anticipate when something breaks, I kind of know what I want to buy, uh, who is the local installer that I want to contact, uh, because I think the problem overall is going to be that most people aren't going to think about this possibility and they're not going to have much time to do research and the contract will come in and basically sell them what they already got. So and then that's uh, I know Ann Arbor is doing a lot of uh, education about electrif electrification, and I think that's real important. I was wondering uh, for air conditioning, would an air source heat pump use less electricity than a conventional air conditioner, uh, house air conditioner? It's probably about the same. Uh, you know, the, the the summer efficiencies are similar. I mean. It, an air source heat pump is an air conditioner. It's just has a couple of extra valves and, and usually a more sophisticated compressor so that it's gonna run more efficiently in the wintertime. Oh, okay, thanks. I think, John, your hand's up, but you, did you have, oh, and then John, the other John, <laughs> Gorley. There's a lot of Johns here. Okay, is John Gorley good to talk? Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I, uh, I have a, a, a heat pump uh, that uh, uh, I had installed uh, something like maybe six or eight years ago, a geothermal one. At the time, um, the, uh, the geothermal time of day rate that DTE offered was, uh, was, was excellent. And uh, so I chose to get the second meter for the heat pump. And then when I installed solar about four years ago, uh, it was still, the electricity that I was uh, paying for for the heat pump was still much cheaper than uh, uh, what I would have to pay for 
uh, through if I if I recombined the meters uh, and uh, 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 ran the heat pump uh, through the same uh, meter as the solar. So I'm still I still have two meters. Uh, I guess uh, Fang, you said that yours is uh, your your heat pump is on the um, on the same meter. And did you did you yeah. compare the two time of day rates and decide that the uh, that the uh, that that the single uh, residential rate was better? Well, I I, I did think about the second meter, but I look at the 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 price difference. I think it's it's not. I I don't know like how the good the geothermal rate is. For me, I can do the core cool current core cool current rate. That discount is, is not significant to compare with time of use rate. And also I need to you know, install a separate meter, you know, so it will cost me another 500 to 1,000. And secondly, if I install a second meter, then my rooftop solar system cannot go, you know, cannot power the, the, H, the, the heat pump because the solar system can only attach to one meter. So, mm -hmm. Then summer, you know, I need the heat pump for cooling service. Then the, that's also the best time to use solar energy. So that's why I think all the factors in. So I, I don't want a second meter for the heat pump. Yeah, it gets really complicated. And um, uh, the, um, well, I guess, I guess we should just leave it at that. Uh, thank you. I have a couple questions. So the the cool currents um, rate, mm -hmm. or what have you, that is, what is that for? Is that for air source heat pumps? It's for air conditioning. Air for, conditioning. For air conditioning, cooling, and the heating. So the cooling rate is different from heating rate. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, it's really complicated. Yeah, and and. Uh, I heard stories from a number of residents. They installed a the Mitsubishi air source system, the heat pump system, very good one. And they installed a separate meter for that system. And uh, but it took them like took months for DTE to figure out how to charge them using use the discount rate. I don't know whether finally they get the correct answer, but. Uh, but when they told me that it's already been like about half a year since they installed the second meter and the DT don't, oh, I, I should not talk about those things. <laughs> no, well, since we have John Richter here, I'll put in my <laughs> two cents about this because having multiple meters for this and that and the other thing is really confusing, especially when you have solar too, and then you're trying to power which meter from your solar. And so my own, um, if two cents in this regard is I think it would be really nice and a strong move in uh, regards to equity in trying to help people electrify their homes to have an all electric home rate that is decidedly less. Um, like if you have all electric that your, your rate goes down substantially, kind of like geothermal is. And that way you could just have a meter and it will incentivize people who are almost all electric to just go all the way there. That's what I think, but I don't know if anyone cares what I think. <laughs> I care, yeah. And there's the same problem for like EV charger rate. You know, they, they offer very right. good discount for EV charging, but they also require you to install a separate meter. Then, you know, like for my case, then I cannot charge my EV use solar energy during weekends. Or I should use another plug, not not connected to the second meter. So I think, like like city of Ann Arbor, we testimony that inconvenience, and you know that that is a barrier for EV adoption. You know, more people will will raise hands. You know, we want a better EV rate. John. John. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the utilities have a lot of these rates based on how what what device is using the energy, right? There's a special rate for a water heater, a special rate for an air conditioner, a special. And that was, in my mind, that, that that's a residual from the days before we had time-based meters. 
And so they were, that was an approximation of, well, if you're doing space heating, so that's winter, that's really off peak. So we're going to give you a better rate. Now that we have time of rate, time of use meters and time of use rates, I think that's all obsolete, right? And you should have one meter, whatever you hook to it is none of their business anyway. Um, and if you use power when there's peak demand, that costs more. And if you use it at times off peak, well, that costs less. And it should be that simple. But, um, you know, things in the world of utility regulation change very slowly. That's why we need an association like GLREA. <laughs> that was such a good segue to end the, uh, <laughs> to wrap the meeting, I think. We do have four more minutes. So if anyone has any last burning comments or questions, some really good stuff going on in the chat. But um, if anybody wants to pipe in, otherwise, I really loved that as uh, it was so symmetrical. To end the meeting on Fung's comment about, and that's why we need GLREA. <laughs> okay, I'm going to call it then. Um, Fung, wow, thank you. This was amazing. And I do believe that this um, presentation will be on the GLREA YouTube. Um, so if folks uh, want to relook at it, because Fong had such really good, dense information, it'll be there. And if you want to pass it on to your friends who are also data wonks, by all means. Um, and Fong, I miss you. It was so good to see you on a personal level as well. Really appreciate you coming. And thanks, GLREA. Yes. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Have a